You're listening to Inner Guidance Channel. Tonight's subject is the cup of foaming wine. We're told in the book of Psalms, In the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed. His 75.8 I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. This cup is man's fate. The wine is well mixed. It's not all bitter and it's not all sweet. It's mixed, foaming wine, well mixed. One being takes it, and in that taking, shall I not take the cup which the Father has given me? John 18, 11. So one being takes it, and we are contained in the one being, but we were contained before the foundation of the world. As we are told in scripture, God called us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He destined us in love to be his sons, according to the purpose of his will. F1, 4, 5. From that moment on, there was no turning back, and it was a play. And we are all controlled by a power beyond ourselves who has fixed us in a vast and firm pattern. Nothing happens that is not his doing. He has a time for everything, and everything happens exactly on time. We play all the parts, and in the very end, we come out, and we are God. It's the only way that God could give himself to us, that we would know we are God. This is told in the parable of the prodigal son, Log 1531. He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting that we make merry and be glad, for this your brother was dead, and he is alive. He was lost, and he's found. But the first son could not understand that. If I owned the earth, I could die of starvation for the want of a little food, though I owned it all, if I didn't know that I owned it. Until we come out from the Father, and separate from the Father, and go through the play, we do not know we are the Father. So to give me himself, I must separate from the Father. And when man separates from the Father, at that very moment there is a tragedy, and a triumph, a fall, and a beginning of a new creation. Because complete incarnation is essential to individuality, yet this incarnation involves separation from God the Father, death and descent into hell. We're in hell now. This is hell. We have taken the cup and drained it. Well, we drained it in Christ Jesus. And bear in mind, we are all crucified with him. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Gal tu Tunchani. So all together came out, and all are being formed into the image of God, moving back as God himself. But it does involve a complete forgetfulness, and as we come out, we fear we never again will see our Father, who is built in from all eternity within ourselves. We can't see him on the outside, for he's given himself now, given himself to us. So we can't see him on the outside. When we next see him, it's our self. We actually awake as God the Father, and we return, and the fatted calf is ours, and the ring and the robe and the scepter and everything that was given to that second son who went out. But we cannot crow, because we did not volunteer to go. As we are told in the eighth chapter of Romans, that the creature was made subject unto futility, not of his own will, but by the will of him who subjected him in hope, that the creature would be set free from this bondage to corruption and obtain the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Verse 20. So we cannot crow of any bravery on our part. We were simply selected, we were chosen. So he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world and all together fell. We are the gods who fell in the one that is God, God the Father. And so we were told then, you will die like men. You are gods, sons of the Most High. But you don't know it. You don't know you are one with your Father. And so, and fall as one man, O princes, as 82, 1, 6. So the fall is on but it is the beginning of a new creation, something far greater than ever before, because we are now individualized, 
each to know himself as God the Father. Now let me share with you some of these marvelous visions that came this past week. It's so unlike what the world thinks it's going to be, so completely unlike it. Here, a lady writes, I'm on a boat. I'm going down the coast of California. I turn to someone on the boat and I say to him, let me know when we pass Point Conception, just when we pass Pant Conception. And then, why we passed that away back there, 30 miles back, don't you remember? She feels a little bit foolish, a little bit, I would say, unnerved. And she said to this one, oh yes, I do, I'd forgotten. Point Conception passed 30 miles back. Well, now that is a measure of space, but it really is a measure of time. It was 30 years ago. Now listen to the second part of this. This happened on the 17th of May. On the 18th of May, this happened. I am in a strange home, and here I am too. Not one, there are two of us. I, the real one, the spirit being, and here one that resembles me, looks just like me, with the only difference, it looks like clay. It's the color of clay, and it seems to be dead. It is standing up, but it appears to be dead. It seems to be simply a shell. And then, attached to the navel of this zombie, and then attached to an infant that I'm holding in my hands, is this long umbilical cord. One to the navel of this zombie, and one to a baby, a little infant that I'm holding in my arms. I said to myself, I only thought it. I did not voice it. I simply thought it. Why, they must drive to the hospital and have the cord severed. At that very moment, this zombie moved as under compulsion, as though it were completely subjected to my thinking, and it moved towards the car. Then I entertained the thought, I wonder if they will dirty the car. Then I said, certainly not, not that kind of birth with the emphasis on that. Then I thought again, you must slide under the wheel. And my thought was conveyed to her and the body simply slid under the wheel. Then I reached over and put the baby next to her, to this body of mine. I looked at myself and it was a shell, something that was dead. And I put it next to her. Then I said to myself, no need to worry, they'll make it all right. Then I woke. I can say to this lady, if it hasn't happened since you wrote me the letter, your birth, my dear, is imminent. Everything in it, the symbolism is perfect. 30 miles back, and Jesus began his ministry when he was 30 years of age. After pond conception, after conception by the Holy Spirit, one is born. In my own case, it was exactly 30 years. That's why I told a friend of mine here, it's going to take you 30 years. At the moment she heard it, she didn't like it. She wanted it tonight after what took place in her world. Well, I still say in my case, and I can only speak from experience, I followed the path of the pattern man. I did say, because the mystery of life must be understood in terms of faith and therefore don't give up. I'll say to her, she's not here tonight, but I would say to her, don't give up. If you feel you can shorten the interval, by all means do it. But I'm only saying that in my own case, it was 30 years between that embrace of the risen Lord and my birth from above. So here, this lady had passed the point of conception 30, well, it's 30 years ago, but she had forgotten it, for she confessed in the second dream, I'd forgotten that. Don't you know you passed it? Oh yes, but I'd forgotten it. So many of us do not bring it back to the surface, for here is one, a friend of mine who is here tonight, and he in his dream, a very vivid dream, in the depths he is healing an enormous number of people. By healing, he said, they, weren't, they were not all physical cases. In fact, the majority were not physical. But there were all kinds of things needing to be helped, and I am healing, I'm actually healing everyone. It takes me two seconds to a person, and they're all walking away healed and very happy. 
they were not all physical cases. There was a group of people bringing me one after the other. And then I said to myself, what am I, a healer? Am I a teacher? Just who am I? So I asked the group, and they took a book, and they opened the book, and then pointed to the right side, bottom, and here was the name of a man. He said, I can't bring who the name is. It is not in scripture. It has a great sound of a Hebraic sound, but it is not in scripture, not that name that he brought through. But the tone of the story as he read it, that this one was the most effective of all healers. And even to the end of his days when his bones were withered and dried up, he was still the effective healer. Then he thought, as I contemplated on this state, that that's not a very desirable thing. I don't want to live a very long life just healing a bunch of people, but he's doing it anyway. He did it with his father. That was healing. Wasn't a physical thing. Lifting him from low man on the totem pole to the very top one in the entire area so that he is really the outstanding one in all the Western states by his own confession in a letter that I got from him today. So here is a fantastic healing. That's not physical. That was a professional healing. From the low man in his own profession to the top man in his profession beyond this state. So, in his case, I would remind him that Job, at the very end of his career, when he prayed for his friends and forgot himself, his own captivity was lifted. The fortunes that he lost in the interval all returned a hundredfold greater. And everything that he lost, including his children, his wife, his friends, they all returned but multiplied. And his fortunes were enormous by turning from self to the help of another. For really in the end there is no other, it's one's self pushed out. So any time that I exercise my imagination lovingly on behalf of another, I am actually doing it to myself. And because I'm doing it to myself, I'll find my world without taking thought, just simply expanding beyond my wildest dreams. Financially, physically, everything expands in my world if I would do it in that manner. So I would say to him, it's a marvelous thing that you did. What I'm getting at is this. In his letter, he said, when it came through or came to the surface mind, he couldn't remember the name. He was desirous to remember that name, for they pointed to the name and the story attached to the name. So he went back to sleep and fell into the depths. In the depths, he remembered. As he surfaced, he forgot it. Went back in and he remembered. As he surfaced, he forgot it. He said, Neville, the next morning when I woke, my bed looked like a football field that had been really well played because all night long he was going into the depths, remembering it perfectly, surfacing and forgetting. So the lady who wrote the first letter that I used tonight, she forgot that she passed that point of conception and then admitted, yes, I forgot, but she was looking forward to that moment in time when she would conceive of the Holy Spirit. She has already conceived and it's time for delivery. I would say to her, it's imminent. Another lady here, she said, in my dream, I was explaining scripture to a young Negro man. All I can remember was this. Having explained scripture, I said to him, our name is the Lord God of hosts. Well, that's marvelous, that when you in the depths of yourself know your name and can turn to another one of a different race and bind yourselves together in that unity and say, our name is the Lord God of hosts. Well, that's tremendous growth and expansion in the awakening of the mind of God in man. And so they came really in a most marvelous way, one after the other this week, as you're all moving toward the inevitable end. So don't falter, keep them coming, one after the other. Now, I told a story about a week ago, in fact, it's a week since I've been here, where this lady said that I appeared in her vision. And then, as she saw me, I gouged out my eyes and then extended them to her. Then I walked forward, and with my thumbs, 
I pressed them into her eyes, giving her eyes that could see outside of anything known to mortal minds. Then I bent over, and my head grew to enormous proportions, and it became transparent. And within it, every living thing in the universe was contained within my head. Then I rose, and my head returned to its normal size. Then I raised my right hand, and then... The top of my head bent over and showed her, and the greenest of green grass was coming out of it. When I went over the first time and pressed my eyes into her eyes, I called her brother. She is a lady, mother of two, and very much a lady, in her twenties, but very much a woman. But I called her brother. Now her letter that came this week tells me that a radiant being of gold walked out of her, and it was a man. Then he turned and looked back at her. Then, in the deepest bass voice, with his hand extended, he said, Grab my hand and come on. That morning, she sat in her rocking chair and fell into a doze, and the entire scene replayed itself, with one exception. She found herself in the replayed scene, measuring the distance between where he stood and where she, in her body, lay. Then she heard a voice coming from within her, and the voice said, He is two weeks away. She took it to mean that he is at the middle between where I am and where he is. Were I you, my dear, accept it literally. It should be on you now, and she'll know who it is that came out. I call you all brothers for the simple reason we are brothers. We're all sons of God. In this world of division, yes, we are men and women, and we are sons and daughters. But not in eternity. In eternity, we are all sons of God, and together form God. So I called her advisedly in the vision, brother, and in scripture he did not say, Go unto my sisters and tell them. He said, Go unto my brethren and tell them I ascend unto my God and to your God, unto my Father and unto your Father. Jin 20, 17. So go to my brethren and tell them. It's all one grand brotherhood all. Regardless of the female garment worn today or any other garment, we're all brothers in eternity. And together, collectively, we form the one body, the one spirit, the one Lord, the one God and Father of us all. F44. Then she said, I, I saw a pulsing living organism. It was an organism, but it was pulsing and living. Then I noticed a little trap door. Then I noticed a little man who had found the trap door and he opened it. Then he was being squeezed out of this pulsing organism. Now, that's a beautiful adumbration, a forecasting of the birth. For a man comes out of what seemingly from the outside for one moment is completely sealed and closed. But there is a trap door and he discovered it. He was within, no one moved it from without. He discovered it and he was within that organism. And then as he opened it, he is being squeezed out through that trapdoor. That's what man finds. It's within his own skull, and he awakes within his skull. He intuitively knows that at the base of his skull, there is that little trapdoor. And he pushes, and it does give, the stone rolls away. He comes out, and he squeezes himself out. You don't walk through that door. It's a very narrow gate. Narrow is the gate. Wide that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate. And you come out of it as a child, comes out of the womb of a woman, you squeeze out. And that's your birth from above. So here, all are moving towards the inevitable end, which is to awaken as the Lord Christ Jesus. And everyone will, may I tell you. No one will fail and no one will turn back. The wine is mixed and very, uh, um, as Blake so beautifully told it, joy and woe are woven fine, a garment for his soul divine. It's not all bitter and it's not all sweet. What we have at a Jewish wedding, we always have the little sweet wine and the little bitter wine, but there's always more in the sweet glass than there is in the bitter glass. The bride and groom must drink from these two glasses. They must take the very, very dry wine and the sweet wine. Then the rabbi puts these glasses down and crushes them, puts them under his feet, and he crushes the glasses after they've taken both the sweet 
and bitter, but always more in the sweet glass than there is in the bitter glass. So this is the foaming wine of the 75th chapter of the book of Psalms. In the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed. It's very well mixed as you go through life. Today I came back from a funeral. A friend of mine, a close, dear, intimate friend of mine who had everything on the surface to live for, but everything. Making $350 a week and doing what the world would envy. Doing it beautifully. Only 33 beautiful, perfect figure everything. And then for reasons not explained because she left no note to anyone, she simply decided to call it a day. What a blow to her parents when they all lived for her. And so I was asked to say a few things to comfort them because she's not there. And so they wondered why. What on earth would cause them to have this experience? Well, God knows. It's not only the one who departed, but those who are left have to learn the experience. So they were all very emotional and weeping and weeping. I had to point out to them that the very shortest verse in Scripture is Jesus wept. He wept at the same moment, just like this, at a funeral for the one that he loved dearly. And Jesus wept, the 11th chapter of the book of John. So if one could depart this world and find no one in the world to shed a tear that would be the most pathetic thing in the world, that someone could go and no one cared enough to shed one tear, that would be a horror of horrors. In other words, that would be a monster departing. But no, she did have multiple tears shed, but she had her lesson to learn. And they, by being left not able to touch her and feel her and talk to her, they had their lesson to learn, and so they learned it. In the end, and only in the end, do we understand the play. So we are told, according to my purpose, I have called you. And then he tells us what his purpose is. As I willed it, so shall it be. As I have planned, so shall it stand. And my will shall not return until I have executed and accomplished the intents of my mind. In the end, in the latter days, you will understand it perfectly, is 14.24. For I put the whole plan into the mind of man, called eternity. But I put it so that man cannot find out what I've done from the beginning until the end, etc. 3.11. In the end, man will find out. The end will come suddenly upon man in a series of dramatic mystical experiences. His birth and resurrection from above. Resurrection first, followed immediately by the birth. Then the discovery of the fatherhood of God as himself, because the father's son calls him father. Then the complete splitting of the curtain of the temple, and it is his own body that is split. Then his ascent into the Holy of Holies, in the only way that you could never get up. He goes up in a serpentine form, because he's going into Zion. And David captures Zion, by going up the stairway in a circular motion. For if we read the scripture the way he took Zion, he could only have taken it if he built the stairway in a spiral. And so he goes into Zion, which is the Lord's choice of his habitation. Then comes the final seal of approval with the descent of the dove upon the one who has had these three experiences. And the voice does declare that he loves you. That is the end of the drama. You remain only to tell it as Paul remained to tell it. After the whole thing was done, he had to remain to tell it. He did say he would rather depart this world and be with Christ in the risen state, but the need was greater for others, and so he had to remain in the flesh until a certain moment when he's relieved forever and enters the one body, the one spirit, the one Lord, the one God and Father of all. So here, that wonderful parable. Someone complains. He doesn't know he has it all because he hasn't journeyed. He wasn't called. He wasn't chosen. There are unnumbered who are not called, who are not chosen. And we complain because we suffer and we can't afford to suffer. But we, in the Father's eye, were so loved, he wanted us, knowing the horrors that we have to pass through. But with Paul, he said, 
I consider the sufferings of the present time not worth comparing with the joy that is to be revealed in us. Ramad 8, 18. So we suffer, certainly we suffer. The loss of a child, it need not be a physical pain, but that is a more enduring pain than a physical pain. The physical pain, we can relieve it somewhat, and the chances are it will pass away in a normal span of time. But the loss of one you love dearly doesn't pass away that way. Everything reminds you of the one that goes, especially a favorite child, 33, successful in the business world, and everything to live for. But who knows God's plan? God planned it because he's crucified with Laulgu. He said, no one takes away my life. I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down and the power to lift it up again. And so he's wearing my cross as he's wearing your cross. He's wearing every cross. But he has succeeded in his purpose because in one he did rise and in others he rose and he's rising in this room here. He's rising. There are those who have risen in this room and therefore I say he is continuing the resurrection. Eventually all will rise and all that came out will return risen just as God the Father had planned it. Now, another one came. This is an interesting one. She said, I'm in a large, beautiful house, dimly lit. There are about, oh, several hundred people present. There was a single, I would say, aisle leading up to a stage. On the stage was an enormously large table. There were people at both ends and then the far back, not the side facing the audience, but the back side of the table. Suddenly someone said something and I looked up and there you were standing in the center of that table. Not on it, but at the center of the table, dressed in a white robe. I said to this one who drew my attention to you, why Neville isn't given to theatrics. And with that, I found myself on the stage. Before I left that party, I said, he always is here for a lecture, not theatrics. So she finds herself on the stage, and then I turn to her and I'm in my civilian clothes, dressed in normal civilian clothes. And I say to her, I'm not here to give a lecture. Come, this is the last dinner. And then she woke. She said, as I woke, I could not help but relate it to my pictures I've seen of the Last Supper. That's something that always comes before the inevitable end. But this time the end from it all, not restoration, but complete freedom into the liberty of the sons of God. So he gives his last dinner. Now she has that and very sweetly wrote the whole thing out for me. So your visions and your dreams have been perfectly marvelous and please keep them coming. I have many when I talk on Monday night because Monday will be based upon the world of Caesar in the use of imagination. They will be told on Monday, this coming Monday. The subject will be imagining creates reality. Having this on a Monday night and Friday night, people are always wondering, is he talking tonight about it? And rather than come and be disappointed, they just don't come. So I've taken this small ad in tomorrow's paper to let people know once more, I will be here on Mondays and Fridays that follow until the end of June. And for those who like the world of Caesar, the majority do. I've titled a few. One is, Imagining Creates Reality. And the second is, There is No Fiction. So be careful what you imagine, for there is no fiction. These are my two subjects for next week. Now let us go into the silence. <laughs> 